Welcome to our Monticello live stream. Today, we're talking with Thomas Jefferson as interpreted by Bill Barker about his winter memories. Leave your questions in the comments and let us know where you're watching from. Oh, citizens, good afternoon and welcome to our Monticello. You are brave and hardy souls uh, to come out on such an inclement day. Well, and after all, uh, it is uh, the dead of winter, is it not, uh, this January? And a new year, a happy new year to you all, this year of 24, 18 and 24. Be mindful, I was not here in 1724, and I'm certainly not going to live to see 19 and 24. As Sir Francis Bacon has written, time is a plateau in the great scheme of things in the universe. For us, mankind, it is all happening at once. I welcome you here this day to reflect upon winter times, the winters that I have known, particularly the Januarys that I have known. And so as you've gathered here in, well, as we've come to know it, the honeymoon cottage, I am more than happy to welcome you into this intimate parlor. In fact, I will tell you it, uh, it has been long known that when a, um, a land was claimed and patented, the patent then to go to the patent office, formerly in Williamsburg when we were a colony and even still there when we became a commonwealth, uh, the patents meant that you must establish the recognition of your permanent seating upon that land by building a dwelling at least 12 foot square. That would be known as the hall that had to be accomplished within two years. And then, of course, as you settled therein, your family to prosper, or perhaps not yet married, to be married, you would build a parlor uh, onto the hall. And it became known simply hall and parlor, uh, which are the majority of the tobacco farmers' farm houses, uh, somewhat akin to that house in which I was born. So you might refer to this as a parlor rather than a hall. Now, it's certainly 12 foot square. Uh, I will not deny that. But the parlors became known for moving the stead, that is the bed and the stead, out of the hall into that smaller adjacent room, which was called the parlor, so that it would be predominantly the bedchamber, which included the bed. Now, you wonder parlor from the French parlor to talk because in the winter time, in this time of year, the families would gather there in the bedchamber, the smaller room, more warmed by the hearth uh, to engage their conversation, often with the parents or grandparents uh, within uh, the bed upon the stand. So we are very much uh, within a parlor here. Uh, as I first built it, it was my hermitage. Uh, I began construction, and I believe it was about 1770. When I was 25 in 1768, I leveled the top of our mountain, Monticello, off, uh, and then began to build this one-room cottage, my hermitage. Now, of course, when I married, but then bringing my bride 120 miles into the wilderness here to where I was already residing, well, this is the building in which we began our married life. And so it has ever been known as the Honeymoon Cottage. Welcome herein. Now, I know you have many questions, and already I've taken up a great deal of our time by my uh, reflections and explanations, which I want to do. But I want this to be your time. So I look forward to your questions. Mr. Barry, uh, what questions are for us? Well, thank you, Mr. Jefferson. Uh, January must be the coldest month for everyone at Monticello. What memories can you share with us about Januarys in your life? It is, in my opinion, the coldest month for the majority of us here uh, in Virginia. And you see me still wrapped. And I beg pardon for that because we have not even made a fire. I've often suggested that the fires in nearly every single room in the mansion house at Monticello House have a hearth, a fireplace. But I've instructed that the fire be started when it reaches between 50 and 55 degrees. So I beg pardon. On this day, it is certainly uh, below 50 degrees on the Fahrenheit scale. So we should look forward to have a fire uh, made shortly. But so I am still uh, dressed 
uh, to keep myself warm here in a rather cold uh, chamber. So I will tell you that uh, January indeed has proved in my uh, weather observations to be the coldest, but on the average, uh, particularly this January thus far, though it is still young, uh, it has been about 46 degrees. Well, we will welcome the cold weather as it arrives. We have to, because that helps provide a resuscitation of nature uh, as the spring months come on. So as I reflect upon the many winter times, and particularly the Januarys, well, I think you heard me reflect upon perhaps the most important January in my entire life. Uh, and that is when I married on the first of the year, January 1st, 1772. Uh, married to a, a widow. She was a widow by only a few years. Uh, the widow of the late Bathurst Skelton, S-K-E-L-T-O-N, Bathurst, B-A-T-H-U-R-S-T, who actually was a classmate of mine at the Old Royal College of William and Mary. Uh, they were married, uh, I believe it was in 66, the autumn of 66, but lamentably, they were only married for two years. Uh, Bat Skelton, as I referred to him, uh, was killed in a carriage accident on the road from Williamsburg to Jamestown. Now, they had a young boy. Many people do not know this. They had a young boy named John, Jackie uh, Skelton. And uh, when I first met the widow Skelton, oh, I had known her uh, as a maiden lady. I, I met her in Williamsburg the winter of 59 and 60 when I first went to attend the Old Royal College of Women Mary. Uh, I, of course, referred to her as Miss Wales, Martha Wales the eldest of the four daughters uh, of the late John Wales of Charles City County. But after she was married, well, of course, she went off to engage her own family. Uh, she lived at Elk Hill uh, Plantation. Uh, that is where the Skeltons, Mr. and Mrs. Batter Skelton, uh, began their family. And the first uh, of their children was a young boy, uh, Jack Skelton. When I met the widow Skelton after her husband had passed away, uh, young Jackie, of course, was very much a lovely little child. And so as we began our courtship, I had every intention to take on uh, that foster parenthood of the, of the young John uh, Skelton, if, of course, uh, Mrs. Skelton, the widow Skelton, would accept my proposal. Well, she certainly did. And as we were preparing uh, to be wed, well, lamentably, young Jackie Skelton, young Jock, John Skelton, took ill uh, that June of 1772 and passed away. Excuse me, 1771. That was the whole purpose that we, we waited for our marriage. Waited a good six months to begin the new year uh, with our marriage that that might help relieve her distress. Wow, that's sounds incredibly sad and, and tragic. When you and Mrs. Jefferson first arrived at Monticello, did construction on the main house begin right away? What was the progress? Well, uh, as we were married at the forest, uh, the, the farm uh, where uh, Mrs. Jefferson was born and grew up, her father's farm, Charles City County. Uh, after the, the marriage, I think it was about a two week period that uh, we remained at the forest before I hitched up my phaeton. Uh, that's a gentleman's uh, carriage. And we embarked westward that I might introduce her uh, to my mountain area where we would uh, live and begin our family. Uh, that, of course, would have been a usual uh, oh, four-day ride, no more than four days. Uh, it was a bit longer because we were caught in a blizzard. What we did not know it was the largest blizzard yet recorded in Virginia history. So we arrived here about the end of January. Now, as I mentioned, this hermitage, my hermitage, was already constructed. And you might say the moment that I carried Mrs. Jefferson over the threshold, it did then become our honeymoon cottage. But I already had plans for the construction of a mansion house right out there on the east side uh, of the lawn. Uh, in fact, the plans uh, I had in mind were similar to plate number 37 in Mr. James Gibbs' book on architecture. It would be an Italianate uh, type of villa, if you will, a center section, two stories, with one-story addendums. So 
I had already begun to dig the foundation of what would be the dining chamber uh, on the uh, north side uh, and as well the bed chamber, which would then be on the opposite, the south side, uh, filling that in later uh, with that center section, the hall, you might refer to it. So certainly they were not completed when Mrs. Jefferson and I moved into our honeymoon cottage, but it began to take shape uh, within uh, certainly that year of 17 and 72 and, and the next 17 and 73. So though my plans had already been set before we married, and though the foundation of the dining chamber, the bed chamber, uh, were already begun as we were married, uh, then we later moved into the mansion house. Sounds like quite the work in progress. And someone has asked us, uh, Chester, what was the downstairs portion of the honeymoon cottage? Was there anyone there? Chester, the, the below stairs you're saying from the bed chamber where we are seated right now, that was the kitchen. And uh, that, of course, was entered by a staircase uh, at this opposite corner of the room. You would take the steps down and then there was the kitchen. And it had an access door out onto the south side of that ground floor, you might refer to it. You'd walk out the access door and there was that magnificent uh, ocean view, as I still refer to it, the gentle undulation of the treetops like waves of foliage into the distance. And uh, out that kitchen door as well uh, was the well. Just, just to the left uh, was that well dug there uh, for the service of, uh, of my hermitage and uh, our honeymoon cottage. So you might say that uh, the house was, um, well, um, by level, uh, two levels there, a uh, split level with the ground floor entering into the kitchen and then the above stairs or the first floor, uh, the formal chamber. Sounds like quite the project. Now, I'm curious to hear, can you tell us about any of the enslaved families living at Monticello? Maybe that might have been working in the kitchen? Well, do you know, as you're referring, of course, uh, to uh, my initial move into the uh, honeymoon cottage where I now live and the building of the house, uh, we cannot really speak of this with respect to my marriage with the late Mrs. Jefferson without recognizing that as I've written, my marriage doubled my comfort, that as we married at her father's plantation, the forest in Charles City County, that as part of my late wife's dowry, several families accompanied us to live here uh, at Monticello. I would say the most prominent of, of all of the enslaved families that uh, I think back on and still of, of great influence to all of us here at Monticello is the Hemings family. Uh, the Hemings family were well known already in Charles City County. Elizabeth Hemings, uh, the mother, if you will, of, of many children. It is believed that Elizabeth Hemings was originally enslaved by the Epps family. My late wife's mother was Martha Epps, and, and Martha Epps uh, was born and grew up at Bermuda Hundred Plantation, uh, just there in the curls of the James River as it flows down past Richmond uh, before it widens out, of course, uh, just beyond Shirley uh, Plantation. And so it, it is believed that Elizabeth uh, uh, Hemmings, uh, born and brought up at, uh, at the Epps Plantation at, at Bermuda 100. Uh, she herself appears uh, to have been the daughter of an uh, English sea captain. At least that is what is generally said and related even to this day. One Captain John Hemmings. And, uh, and it is said that her mother uh, was uh, an enslaved African decidedly so. So with that in mind, as Elizabeth or Martha uh, Epps then married John Wales, part of Martha Epps' dowry was Elizabeth Hemings uh, coming to live with the Wales family there uh, at the forest. And there consecutively as Mrs. or the widow Skelton and I married, and then the Mrs. Jefferson and I uh, embarked westward, amongst several families, the Hemings family came to live with us as well. 
So certainly from the very beginning, Elizabeth Hemings and, and her children were of, uh, of great importance uh, to the entire utility uh, of all of our Monticello. I can't imagine all that work uh, she must have done in traveling. Now, when ultimately uh, did your family move into the main house at Monticello? Well, that is a very good question. To my recollection, uh, I believe that uh, that the bedchamber, uh, let alone the, the dining chamber, were finally uh, ready to be occupied, to be lived in, uh, if only the hall into the mansion house. Mr. Jefferson, it looks like we might be having some technical issues on our end, so we apologize to, to you and our visitors. Uh, so one moment as we try to figure that out. Um, technical, that's a new word I've been hearing of late. It's becoming quite fashionable. It's um, considered to be the art of scientific investigation, technical technology. I welcome that. Well, we're always trying to find new ways to improve our technology here. And as I'm well, sure you're aware. Uh, absolutely. I will follow science wherever it should lead us. I have always believed that man and science are on a continual advance. And for what purpose? To improve the condition of man. This is an opportunity that we happily utilize uh, in order that we can speak with far more uh, individuals who may be able to come and visit us directly at El Monticello. Well, if you'll just wait one moment. I can wait for centuries. <laughs> Am, am I to be understood? If not seen, I may be heard, it seems... which is quite the contrary to what I was brought up uh, and children are expected. Someone tells me that there is a slight delay in what I may say, but that is well understood if we, uh, the majority of us uh, are at a great distance. Good heavens, it reminds me of when my good friend Robert Fulton, collaborating with our mutual friend Robert Livingston, uh, improved the uh, mechanics of a steam engine uh, in placing it in a great boat on the Hudson River to sail the distance between New York, the port of New York, and Albany City, a distance of 150 miles. And to think that it could make that distance within 36 hours I still consider to be phantasmagorical. So when you refer to a delay, uh, when you think that 150 miles could only be covered by at least, oh, maybe six, uh, seven days in the saddle or upon a phaeton or an otherwise elegant Landau carriage, to think that that be, may be narrowed to 36 hours is certainly far less of a delay. So I, I venture to say whatever may be experienced at present, uh, is even a shorter delay of what would be a 36 hours of a delay over 150 miles. Well, it seems hopefully that the delay is not too bad, but we must press on. Press on indeed, as they said upon that great expedition led by my kinsman, my former secretary, Captain Meriwether Lewis. We proceeded on. Oh, you could say we press on one and the same. Well, well, we on our end continue to fix some things up. It seems like we have a lot of questions for you, uh, Mr. Jefferson. I would welcome the fact that the delay has brought it on. Now, people are, are very curious to hear, um, did you have uh, any favorite spots at Monticello? And do you know of any favorite spots Mrs. Jefferson had at Monticello? Well, I can assure you that the favorite spot betwixt Mrs. Jefferson and myself is right here. Uh, why else to reflect on it with great warmth and deep emotion as our honeymoon cottage. So I would say collectively, yes, Mrs. Jefferson's uh, favorite spot. I would, oh, I, I know, I have no question about it. Uh, and my favorite spot remains this, this honeymoon cottage. You know, two of our children were born here uh, before we moved the family, as I mentioned, uh, over to the mansion house. Uh, our first child, our little girl, uh, Martha, 
uh, was born here within uh, a year after we were married. Martha or Patsy, as I refer to her, was born in September uh, of 17 and 72. And then, uh, let's see, uh, it was uh, about two years later in 74 uh, that our second child, Jane, a name for my mother, uh, was born here in this little cottage. And so it was at that time, I believe Jane was born in April. Lamentably, she did not live very long. But it was shortly after that, uh, Jane still living, of course, and our eldest child, uh, Patsy, uh, we moved into the mansion house. And then our other children, our other four children, uh, were born uh, there in the mansion house. Well, thank you so much for your patience, Mr. Jefferson. And, and thank you for sharing us a little bit more about uh, you and Mrs. Jefferson's children. Um, we're curious, did you live anywhere else with uh, you and Mrs. Jefferson and your children? Yes, as a matter of fact, I can tell you that part of my wife's dowry was the inheritance of many thousands of acres uh, after her father, Mr. John Wales, passed away. And do you know that was a, a little more than a year after we were married? Mr. Wales passed away in May of 1773. And so I set out uh, within that summer of 73 to investigate uh, all of the properties that I inherited uh, through my late wife's dowry. And one of them, perhaps the finest, uh, is about 75 miles south from here uh, in Bedford County, which had been named by Mr. Wales as Poplar Forest. In fact, that 4,000 acres of the Poplar Forest plantation uh, was part of surveyed by my father, uh, the late Colonel Peter Jefferson. And one of the two creeks that uh, traverse through that land, uh, the one being Tomahawk, and the other is Judith, a name for my Aunt Judith, my, my father's sister. So Poplar Forest is a place where the late Mrs. Jefferson, uh, our family, and I all lived uh, when we would take leave, if you will, of Monticello uh, to go down and oversee the cultivation of a very fine grade of tobacco uh, at Poplar Forest. And uh, I can assure you, I will never forget that when I was nearly captured by the enemy, and we have had that story engaged many a time together, uh, that I will never forget that as I was able to escape, as my family was able to escape, we all together uh, arrived safely at Poplar Forest and spent that month of June 17 and 81 as one of the happiest months of my entire married life. I thought I had ended my public service there. Uh, I had left the office of governor of our Commonwealth of Virginia. It had passed on to General Nelson uh, and then later Mr. Fleming. But uh, I can assure you that month of June 1781 was the epitome of domestic felicity. It sounds like a, a very happy time for both you, Mrs. Jefferson. What was your time together with your family your last January when you lived in the governor's palace in Williamsburg. Like. Oh, my, my heavens. Well, that is correct. You are correct that uh, my family and I were the last residents of the old royal governor's palace in Williamsburg, Virginia. I cannot help but reflect that when I first rode into Williamsburg that winter of 59 and 60 to attend the old Royal College of William and Mary, I would have never, it would have never been in my most extensive phantasmagorical dreams that I would someday uh, be the rightful uh, occupant of that palace. And indeed, it was a grand building, very grand. Um, uh, it was a bit heavy. It was in the Dutch fashion. Uh, I would not say it was the finest of all of the buildings in, in Williamsburg. I always thought the Capitol building was the most delicate structure. However, uh, during that time, we spent our last Christmas tide in Williamsburg, there in the governor's palace. It was a time of very great turmoil. Oh, those two years that I was governor of the new Commonwealth of Virginia were not the most pleasant two years of my entire life. Uh, I, I look back on it as, as painful. And, and for what purpose? Uh, to help the public as best as I could. An honorable position, I will not deny, but we were in the war. We were in the very crux and the height uh, of our war with Britain. The enemy was already sailing 
into the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, they had landed at Portsmouth, engaging great destruction there. They were continuing to sail up the James River. When I think that our species uh, at that time was devalued to such an extent that the rise in cost of any goods, a pair of shoes, 10 times the value that it had been before the war. And on top of that, the most uh, unproductive of harvests I think I could ever remember, that many people much older than me at the time could ever remember uh, in the history of Virginia, uh, that uh, the crops uh, were just not productive and giving in that harvest uh, of 17 and 79. Uh, and so it was that winter of 17 and 80, it became apparent that as the enemy intended to lay waste to the capital of the Commonwealth of Virginia, there in Williamsburg, and most vulnerable, because Williamsburg sat on the high ground uh, between the James River to the south and the York River to the north, that we had to move the capital. And so that preoccupied me that entire winter. Uh, that our family was living in the governor's palace, that we should move to a much more uh, protected and, and uh, uh, least vulnerable position, which of course would be the heights of Richmond, Richmond town, where you could look right down the James River a great distance to see any approach of the enemy and be forewarned as we would learn of the enemy fleet sailing up the curls, if you will, that I had referred to earlier. So, Though I certainly was the last occupant of the of the governor's palace in Williamsburg, and though I will certainly carry wonderful memories of the 20 years, the 20 years that I was upon the scene there uh, in Williamsburg. When I say upon the scene, coming to attend the Old Road College of William and Mary, uh, to read law, to be licensed to practice law, to be elected to my first public office, the early age, if you will, uh, 26 years to take my seat in the old House of Burgesses, uh, and then to be appointed a delegate to the Continental Congresses, uh, to return, to be seated on the committee to revise the monarchical code of law under which we were all born and grew up, and then to be elected the second governor of the new Commonwealth of Virginia. I, I can only assure you that I cannot help but to look back on my experience in Williamsburg and ever with great warmth and delight, recognition and honor, look upon Williamsburg as, as a capital of hospitality, a capital of good manners, and most importantly, a capital of education. I have actually stated those words. I spoke them to my grandson, Jeff Randolph, Thomas Jefferson Randolph, and I hope that might be recorded for posterity. Well, those are words I think that we can all hopefully uh, see to one day. And one of our guests, Kelly, is really curious to know, how did people spend time in such cold winters? What, what did you and Mrs. Jefferson and your children do? Here we are, Kelly. This is how we spend time. We spend time together. The great warmth of the human bond, as I explained earlier, uh, a parlor. Uh, being that addition onto the hall, if you will. Uh, this at this very inception in, uh, in a typical Virginia farmhouse, uh, to be that center of the family bond, where as the hall might be uh, far too cold, even if it might have two hearths at either end, it was in that intimacy of the parlor uh, where the stead is, that the family could gather and enjoy one and the other's company uh, during the coldest of months, uh, to have a meal here nonetheless, to hear great stories, to welcome people who come in from the cold, uh, to be the warmer and the, the healthier and the more satisfied at the family table. So this is what we enjoyed to do, to play many a game, that we uh, uh, welcome. A, a game of chess is always something that I'm welcome to engage, not only with my dearest friends, but also within the family. And uh, uh, with this respect, a family read is also most welcome. A family musicale, can you imagine the delight that hell holds uh, for securing the family bond? And just the storytelling. The storytelling, which I can assure you from my youth, I have always known to be uh, the great proclivity of Virginians uh, when they gather together uh, and to enjoy their company. So all of this, I can tell you, helps to while away 
uh, these winter hours, though I, I will say I have oftentimes, the older I become, reflected that I should like to be like one of those wee animals who hibernate throughout the entire winter and then awake when spring returns. Oh, I think we all have the propensity to want to sleep the longer, do we not, uh, when there's greater darkness within a day than otherwise throughout the majority of the year. Well, it is certainly dark and rainy here at Monticello today. Uh, and Elaine is curious to know, with all that time you're spending with your family during the winter, do you have any favorite memories at, uh, with Mrs. Jefferson and your small children? Oh, well, now I, I would tell you some of the most favorite memories. Uh, a gentleman would always leave uh, the most secured uh, in his heart. Uh, and I would say otherwise, yes, some of my favorite uh, memories are when our family was uh, first beginning right here uh, in this honeymoon cottage, let alone what I reflected upon earlier uh, during that month of June, though not in the winter, but the month of June uh, at Poplar Forest. Uh, I would reflect upon some of my favorite uh, family memories uh, in Williamsburg, but lamentably, of course, uh, I was not there in the company of my father or my mother, uh, when that would have been the initial uh, scenes of, of familial happiness uh, within uh, our family. I did, of course, uh, meet Mrs. Jefferson there when she was still a maiden lady. And uh, I first began to court her later uh, when she was a widow uh, in Williamsburg. But I would say that, that here upon uh, my little mountain, our little mountain, to be able to, to look uh, out the window down to Shadwell, where I was born and grew up. That brings back a great font of memories of my childhood within the family bond there, let alone as I moved myself here to our little mountain, uh, those many memories I reflected earlier upon, the more intimate, if you will, in the company of my late wife. It must be nice to, to think back upon those memories. And we still have some more questions coming in for Oh, you please, today. I welcome it. This is what winter time is, is all about. I hope you're continuing uh, warm and dry uh, here today. But I think the intimacy of this room is conducive to that. Now, did you ever return back to the honeymoon cottage after you and Mrs. Jefferson left, or did it just stay idle? Oh, my heavens, yes, of course. I have returned here many times. Um, this is but uh, many of the occasions, uh, although I dare say this is an occasion where I welcome all of you uh, to be able to enjoy, uh, well, uh, the many memories that this room affords. But I have often uh, been here alone. I, I certainly did uh, return directly to this spot uh, after we all returned from France. Uh, to ruminate upon what it might have been like had Mr. Mrs. Jefferson lived to accompany me uh, to France, though I cannot say whether that would have occurred had she still lived. I might have been far more the happier uh, simply to, uh, to maintain domestic felicity within the house and by her side than to ever return to, to public life. Um, so I can say that, yes, uh, this room continues to be occupied uh, by our grandchildren, uh, on occasion, too, by visitors who come here and uh, stay a time that we can prepare this room for them uh, at their convenience. Uh, and I apologize again for the fire not to be lit because the temperature still continues at 40. So you can well understand, with the exception of you all, uh, that the room has, has not been taken over as yet. Uh, by a visitor who, who cares to perhaps stay as long as they choose, even throughout the winter. Well, we have one final question for you, Mr. Jefferson. And as we start a new year and we're midwinter, what do you think will be most memorable of this winter? And what are you excited for in this upcoming year of 1824? Well, I think most memorable of this winter right now is that uh, I've learned 
uh, from going over my, my debits and my credits, credits and cash disbursements and, and revenues that I have upwards in various banks, uh, Virginia, of course, and, and our nation's banks, uh, collectively about $10,000 in notes. And, uh, and so this, this is, is redeeming to the extent that, as you all know, and as is typical uh, of the vocation of farming, uh, I'm ever at the mercy uh, of creditors. So the hope is still there. Uh, I'm delighted to say that, uh, as you see me uh, sitting here, warm uh, indeed in this very fine cloak that I am having a cloak right now tailored uh, by Mr. Toole, a quite accomplished tailor here in Charlottesville. So I expect that will be completed shortly. And uh, I've also enjoyed receiving fowl uh, this time of year. Uh, birds are frequently traded amongst us and sent amongst us to enjoy uh, at the meal table. Uh, we have had a, an entire a deer and even half a deer. The other day, half a deer uh, arrived here from Sweet Springs uh, out in the Shenandoah. If you've never had a chance to visit uh, some of the delightful springs in the Shenandoah, Sweet Springs is one of them. And uh, that is where my, my son-in-law, Mr. Epps, accompanied his father, Francis Epps, when, when old Mr. Epps was not feeling very well. They went out to Sweet Springs some years ago in the early part of this new century. I think it was about 18 and 8. And, uh, and lamentably, uh, Frank Epps the, uh, passed away there. But my reflection is upon the delight of the old Sweet Springs, uh, the warm springs, the hot springs, and, and the fact that uh, deer uh, that are... Uh, acquired out there, are often sent eastwards, uh, that we might have the enjoyment of that venison uh, throughout the, the winter months and provide it there for even visitors who come to stay. I also cannot help but think, and to some people this may not be uh, so uh, either of interest or excitement, but it does excite me to know that in this year of 18 and 24, we welcome another presidential election. Now, some of you have heard that uh, President Monroe uh, will not stand for a third term. And uh, it proves him truly to be a gentleman to stand upon that precedence, uh, which many say was begun by the late general, General uh, President George Washington. Uh, well, we all know he did not care to even have a second term, uh, but he happily took on the second term and absolutely refused a third term. And he could have been president for life. Would that John Adams could have set the precedence and welcomed a second term and refused a third. He did not have the opportunity, we all know, who seceded uh, to that uh, office. But it is said I could have served for a third term. And so I set the precedence, refusing a third term uh, back in that presidential election of 1808. So who will be our candidates uh, this year of 1824? Who will take on? the highest office in our government uh, of chief magistrate that has yet to be known. There's suspicion that, uh, that General Jackson is interested. There is suspicion that uh, Senator Clay, Henry Clay, is interested. Uh, there is talk that the son of our former chief magistrate, uh, that John Quincy Adams may be interested. Um, who is to say uh, at this very moment? But that is what keeps me ever the excited and interesting, interested uh, in the process of one of our nation's greatest privileges and honors, the opportunity of a citizen to hold the reins of government, the opportunity for the people to have their voice heard and to engage for the rest of the world what I consider our most remarkable democratic republic. Uh, in fact, I have said that I believe that our government is the world's best hope, and a great faith and a great trust in that cannot help but be a beacon light for the rest of the world. So there are my hopes, there are my interests, uh, there are my elements of warmth uh, to pass these wintry months, uh, made the more so by you all coming to visit. Uh, I look forward uh, to our next meeting. And I cannot help but wish you, as I always do, glad tidings uh, of this season, but most importantly, good health 
and prosperity in this new year. Let me simply say 24.